Okay, so this is the beginning of Mixed Models series of lectures. So I think there will be three or four of these. And I'm going to start with this hair example. So this is not an fMRI data example. Before we begin, make sure you're ready. How is your knowledge of the two-sample t-test? Well, if it's a little rusty, revisit the two-sample t-test three ways. Okay, there is a paper that this is based off of. I think this might even be my first, first paper with um, fMRI. So it's from 2006, Modeling and Inference for, of Multi-Subject fMRI Data. This is in an IEEE journal uh, with uh, myself and Tom Nichols. So the example I'm going to give here is in this paper as well. So mixed model motivation. We're going to start with the simple ANOVA example, and then in the next lecture, I'll relate it to imaging data. And it's the fascinating study of whether or not hair length is different between males and females. Perhaps you've heard of this study. Um, just to give credit, uh, this example originally came from Friston and Holmes. I have no idea in what form. I am under the impression that Tom Nichols heard them tell us either at a lecture or something. I don't think it's in a paper. So it was their great idea, and I think it's just a great illustration for mixed models, this hair example. Okay, so we're going to start our statistical analysis by collecting a single hair per person. So this is a really special study because I'm going to assume we actually, an oracle has come down and told me the variance, one of the variance terms, actually two of the variance terms. So in that sense, this is special, but it's just for illustration purposes. So now let's just think about hair for a second. With hair, we have two sources of variability. Um, there's the variance of hair length within a person. So unless we use a flow B, which is my usual joke for this lecture. I don't know if any of you know what a flow B is. It is this amazing tool that's a vacuum cleaner attached to a hair cutting device. So it sucks your hair into a tube and then it cuts it all at the length of the tube. So you could have pretty low within subject hair length if you use variability if you used a flow B. But typically we have our hair layered so parts are longer, parts are shorter. So you have within person variability in hair length and then between uh, subject variability because we all have different haircuts. As I said, an oracle has come down and told me uh, the within subject variance is one inch or one whatever. Let's do one centimeter. Um, right. So given that, that's all I need, right? I have one piece of hair. I'm going to use that single piece of hair's length as my mean hair length. Then all I need to do to construct a distribution, and all I need, I mean, is a variance. And I was told the variance is one. So for my four females and my four males, I can now construct each of their distributions. Again, I realize in real life we wouldn't be able to do this because the, there's not an oracle to tell us what variance uh, our data have. So, but each of these distributions has a variance of one. Everybody has the same within hair style or haircut with uh, variance. The mean is different though. So this guy has shorter hair than this guy and this girl has longer hair than this girl, and so on and so forth. But generally, you can see these girls have longer hair than these guys. At least it appears to be the case. So now a fixed effects analysis. I'm going to be comparing a fixed effects to a mixed effects analysis. In a fixed effects analysis, the hypothesis is that we are only interested in these exact four men and these exact four women. So we're not assuming that these four people from each gender category were were sampled from an overall distribution, we're assuming that we have the exact four females and the exact four males that we are interested in studying. In this case, our overall variance of the average hair length within gender group is going to be one-fourth sigma squared within. So this is the fixed effects variance. This is the variance for the within gender distribution. Since we averaged four values, this is one-fourth the within subject variance are one fourth of one or 0.25. So that makes sense. Within subject variance one, if you have four subjects on average, it goes down. Okay, so now I can construct the two group distributions based on this fixed effects assumption. So the mean is simply the mean of the four values for the males, and then the variance, you can see it's squeezed in a little bit because it's 0.25. 
Likewise, I have the mean here for the females. Same variance because I had the same number of females, 0.25. Based on these two distributions, since there's very little overlap, we would conclude that the hair length for these four females is significantly longer than the hair length for the four males. Mixed effects, now this is a slightly different hypothesis. This is going to include both within and between subject variances. And what the between subject variance does is it says, you know what, I randomly sampled these women and these men from the population distributions for men and women. That population distribution has a variance associated with it. And I'm actually interested in applying my inferences to the overall population and not just these four people in each group. So that requires knowing a between subject variance. The sigma squared B corresponds to the variability due to the fact that we all have different haircuts. And again, the oracle has kindly come back and said, oh, by the way, that's 49. Fine. So now the mixed effects variance, same idea. You just divide each of those by four and sum them. So 1 fourth plus 49 fourths is 12.5. Notice this is a lot bigger because we are addressing the fact that, hey, these were sampled from a big population. We're actually interested in the population. And just remember, anything with a variance is random. So this is uh, you know, a random subject effect. So we need an extra variance. Now, the mixed effects distributions look like this. So the fixed effects had a variance of 0.25. But the mixed effects is 12.5. It's much bigger. So now you can see these two distributions overlap a bit. And so our conclusion is different. Um, the conclusion here is that based on these data, we cannot conclude that male hair length is shorter than female. So again, the fixed effects variance. Oh, right. So what if we had multiple hairs per subject? This is important. So this is analogous to having adding more runs of data to a subject in an fMRI study. OK, so say we had 25 hairs per subject. So the impact that has is the within subject variance before combining over our four subjects is uh, we divide that by 25. And then we divide by 4 to average over the four subjects. So that dropped it considerably to 0.01. The mixed effects variance, on the other hand, only this first chunk is going to reduce. Adding more hairs per subject isn't going to reduce the between subject variance. So it just went to 12.26. Typically, the between subject variance dominates. This is the case for fMRI data, too. It's definitely good to have a few runs per subject, but if you collect three runs versus, say, six runs, depending on your study, those extra three runs probably aren't going to help much. You're better off spending your money on more subjects. So the wrong model can lead to the wrong conclusion. So in the first scenario, the fixed effects model, we came, forth the, came to the conclusion that there was a significant difference in hair length. But this conclusion is fine, it's just you have to apply it properly. This result only applies to these eight subjects. In the second scenario, using the mixed effects model, we cannot conclude there's a difference in hair length, but this conclusion applies to the population of males and females. Um, just keep in mind, if you fail to include a random effect when there is one, your results only apply to that data sample. And your p-values are almost always going to be smaller than a mixed model p-value. So uh, I'm unsure uh, how this is possible or whether this is possible in SPM, but it is possible to do this in FSL. Uh, to just to click a button that says run the fixed effects model and it runs um, kind of what I just described here. Um, there's a reason for that. I will explain that later. But to be careful that you only use that option in certain scenarios. You cannot use it if you would like to apply your results to the full population. Um, often people use it. Uh, the misleading thing is your p-values drop, and people often get excited when they see p-values drop. I'm a pessimist, so p-values drop a lot. I'm like, well, what did you do here? Should they have dropped, or did we do something wrong? Here's another illustration. This is basically what the model's assuming. So what I'm going to show you is if we were to repeat the study, what the model assumes those repeated studies 
would look like. So let me explain. So we go out and we do our study once. That's sample one. And uh, this is a slightly different test. We have three, uh, three subjects, sorry. Um, I think we had four per group before. Any anyway, now there are three subject distributions. So the assumption is I am plucking data from each of these three subjects distributions. Perhaps it's 25 hairs, perhaps it's one hair from each distribution, but it doesn't matter. Okay, and then I run my statistics. Now the assumption of the fixed effects model is that if I were to repeat my study, so I go out and I'm collecting a new sample of data, the assumption of the fixed effects model is that I'm going to remain with those same three subjects and resample data from those three subjects distributions. So I'm going back to the same three females and collecting more hair from those females. Whereas the mixed effects assumption is that, oh, well, I'm actually going to go out and randomly first select three new subjects and then select hair from those three new subjects. And if I were to repeat it a third time, I'm stuck with those same three subjects in a fixed effects analysis because I'm only interested in this fixed population Whereas in a mixed effects study, I would have, again, three new subjects. So the idea is the group distribution is going to be really narrow here because we're not changing the subjects. Whereas here, the spread of the distribution is accounting for the fact that we have all of these different uh, subject-specific distributions that we're interested in, and we have to account for the variability between the subject-specific distributions. Well, hopefully you got all that. Uh, what happens if you ignore the random subject effect? That's important to know. So if you do it by mistake, you don't get too excited. And what happens to the overall variance when you include a between subject variance? And this is directly related to the previous question. Basically, does it go up or does it go down and why? And what has a bigger impact in reducing the overall uh, mixed effects variance, is what I should have said here, not just variance, adding more hairs per subject or adding more subjects. Thanks. Um, again, you can, if you want to go through the hair example more slowly, it's in that paper. I think it's also in our book. Um, so either resource, obviously the paper's free. All right, have a wonderful day.